and attention to all who enter here. If you're coming into this room with sadness or sorrow, don't bother. The wounds that I received, I got in a job that I love, doing it for people that I love, defending the freedom of a country I deeply love. I will make a full recovery. What is full? That is the absolute utmost physically. I have the ability to recover. And then I will push that about 20% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid regrowth. If you're not prepared for that, go elsewhere. That's Navy SEAL Jason Redman reciting the sign he placed on his door at Walter Reed, putting visitors on notice that he does not want anyone feeling sorry for him due to his combat injuries. Jason shares his inspirational story of tragedy, triumph, and his successful transition into entrepreneurship. Coming up next on Veteran on the Move. Welcome to Veteran on the Move. If you're a veteran in transition, an entrepreneur wannabe, or someone still stuck in that J-O-B trying to escape, this podcast is dedicated to your success. And now, your host, Joe Crane. My good friend and fellow veteran Bob Eulen has come out with his new book titled Transitions 2.0. This is the best book for any transitioning veteran. Check out Transitions 2.0 at veteranonthemove.com slash transitions. Jason Redman, welcome to Veteran on the Move. Before we get to talking about business and entrepreneurship, take us back. Tell us what you did in the Navy. Well, Joe, first off, thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for doing this and your service. You know, as a ground pounder, uh, you know, having uh, a Cobras, Apaches, any of our air assets overhead was huge. So, Thanks. Thanks for what you did. And now giving back to help other veterans. I know that's a big passion of mine. So uh, who is Jason Redman? So Jason Redman was a uh, young man, 17 year old kid that joined the Navy in high school, started boot camp in 2018, or I'm sorry, and uh, at the age of 18 in uh, 1992. And uh, uh, fast forward, got to SEAL training at the young age of 19, graduated SEAL training at 20, and uh, checked into my first SEAL team pre-9-11 and uh, operating in Central and South America doing counter-drug operations and really learning you know, a lot about the military and the world, being this young kid, suddenly being in third world countries and seeing both the hardships they go through and interfacing with other branches and, and even, um, you know, other nations, military units, training them and working with them. Uh, came back from three uh, deployments in Central and South America and became an instructor in my uh, SEAL team. And from there, I got selected for a commissioning program, headed to Old Dominion University in 2001. I actually started school in August of 2001, uh, which obviously I'd only been at school for three weeks when uh, a friend of mine, another SEAL, and I, uh, during a break in class, watched the planes hit the towers on 9-11. Mm-hmm. And of course, we immediately knew, hey, we're going to war. You know, right. this is an act of war. So, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, we were, we were in that program. And uh, I even tried to get out of the program. And I had a great commanding officer uh, of my old command who helped me get into that program and said, hey, this war, I mean, it was very, it was very, um, uh, I mean, he really saw the future. He understood what we were facing. And he said to me, this war is not going to be over quickly. He said, this war will go on for decades. He said, finish school, come back, be ready to lead. So uh, so I stayed, uh, finished uh, school, came back, um, got assigned to my first SEAL team as an officer, uh, made a whole bunch of mistakes as a young leader. Uh, the, the, the entire world in special operations and specifically the SEAL teams changed after 9-11. And uh, all our tactics, everything that I had learned back when I was a young enlisted guy, and here I was, I thought I knew everything. Suddenly, it was all changed. And now I was leading guys who all had combat experience. And I, I'll admit, I really struggled uh, in the beginning, made some mistakes, had to recover from those mistakes. Uh, thankfully, had some good leaders who mentored me and gave me the opportunity to recover. Um, came back from an Afghanistan deployment. Uh, went to U.S. Army Ranger School, 
headed to uh, Iraq after that, uh, right in the height of the Anbar Awakening in 2006. And we got there in the spring of 2007 and pretty heavy combat operations in uh the Anbar province of Iraq got into a bunch of firefights, took out a lot of bad people. And in uh, September of 2007, I was severely wounded in a big gunfight outside of Fallujah, Iraq. I was hit uh, at least eight times that we know of between my body armor and body with two rounds hitting me in the left elbow, almost taking my arm off, destroying my elbow, and I took a round in the face. Hmm. That started a whole new journey of being put back together. But I wanted to finish my career. Uh, I, I had come in to do 20, and I wanted to stay for 20. Uh, I got wounded in my 15th year. Mm-hmm. So uh, thankfully, the SEAL team said, hey, you know, we'll, we'll keep you. And uh, although I wasn't able to be operational anymore, I worked different. I worked in operations. I worked some special projects. I worked some training. And that carried me to about uh, 21 years uh, when I retired. Did you still have to take the the standard uh, Navy PRT or Marine Corps calls it PFT? Did you, did you have to take that and pass that in order to stay in? Or did you have some kind of a special arrangement? I, I did. I had a waiver. Okay. Uh, because it, it took I, – I really, I was under um, – a, a light duty status for the rest of my career because okay. I was undergoing surgeries from the time I was wounded until for four years later, I was still undergoing surgeries. Sure. And and the only reason I asked that is because I, I, there was a Cobra pilot back from the Grenada days where he'd, he'd lost an arm and the, the Marine Corps said, well, well, we'll let you stay in as long as you can pass the PFT. Well, in the Marine Corps, you have to do pull-ups. So he, he worked his butt up. He was able to do at least the minimum number of pull-ups with one arm um, in, in order to stay in. So I thought maybe um, – and that's great that, that they were willing to, to work with you and, and use what you had learned and, uh, and, and keep you around and allow you to retire like that. Yeah, the, the military has come a long way in how they take care of our wounded warriors and the ones that want to stay in working with them to to allow them to still be able to give back in whatever capacity they have the ability to do. And mm-hmm. I, uh, I definitely fell into that category and I was thankful for it to be able to finish my career on my terms despite this catastrophic event that I suffered. Sure. Well, that's great. So, so what did you do the next few years and, and how did that work with your transition out of the Navy when you retired? So, uh, you know, as I was uh, recovering, it led to um, it led to things that I encountered as a wounded warrior. Both uh, in 2007, I was very surprised at the lack of awareness across the country of the number of our uh, warriors who were who were getting wounded, and the impact of the war on our military. Uh, and the number of individuals that we were losing that was starting to climb, of course. And uh, so that was one component. And the other component was, you know, uh, my inability to wear any kind of regular clothing while I was getting put back together. I had, you know, like many of our severely wounded warriors, I had pieces of metal sticking out of my body to hold together, shattered and broken and missing bone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was trached. I had a stomach tube. Uh, my jaw was wired shut. So, um, I couldn't wear regular clothing, so I had to modify clothing in order to be able to function. And, uh, those things came together with a realization that, Hey, you're not the only one that has these issues. And that led to the creation of wounded wear in 2009 while I was still in the hospital. And, uh, and we started producing clothing to raise awareness for the sacrifice of our wounded warriors. And then from there, it started growing into events. And then, you know, fast forward, you know, six years later, in 2015, we expanded into the Combat Wounded Coalition and moved Wounded Wear underneath the Combat Wounded Coalition as a program. And now we are connecting wounded warriors to other vetted veteran wounded warrior nonprofits. And in 2018, we are working with Old Dominion University on the development of a new leadership program for wounded warriors to get them back out in the community as leaders called the Overcome Academy. Well, that's awesome. Now, 
Jason, you're somewhat infamous for when you were at Walter Reed. I know a little bit about your story, and I noticed that, you know, talking with you on Skype here, that's your Skype profile picture, or I think it is. Is that the sign that you had on your door at Walter Reed that I'm looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Can you give us the background on that and tell us what the deal is with that? Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, you know, and that sign has just been an amazing thing. But uh, that sign came to be about two weeks after I was in the hospital at Bethesda, you know, maybe 10 days. And uh, I think for many individuals who suffer uh, any kind of life catastrophic event, obviously something that unexpected that comes along that just rocks your world, whether it's life threatening illness, whether it's severe injury. Um, whether it's the loss of a loved one, you know, it obviously rocks you to your core. And I think there's a period of time where you're in denial. And I know I was in denial at the very beginning of my injury for that first week. Uh, and then at some point you have to come to grips with what's happened and you have to start looking towards the future. And I was kind of in that transition period when I had a couple of people that came into my room who, um, I, I, you know, as is common when you have these injuries and you're on a lot of medication, I drifted off while they were in there. Uh, but I was very lightly sleeping and I could still hear their conversation. And their conversation started to center around pity for my injuries and what a shame that we're sending these young men and women to war and they're coming home broken and for what. Um, and, and when I heard that and I thought about it, it really made me angry. And, uh, when my wife came back into the room, I said, never again, never again is somebody going to come into my room and feel sorry for my wounds. And it was kind of the catalyst for me to say, I refuse, I refuse to feel sorry for myself and I'm not going to tolerate anybody else feeling sorry for me. And, uh, and I wrote out this sign this mantra i didn't give it a whole lot of thought i just penned it right there in the moment and it said attention to all who enter here if you're coming into this room with sadness or sorrow don't bother the wounds that i received i got in a job that i love doing it for people that i love defending the freedom of a country i deeply love i will make a full recovery what is full that is the absolute utmost physically i have the ability to recover and then i will push that about 20 percent further through sheer mental tenacity This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid regrowth. If you're not prepared for that, go elsewhere. And uh, we signed it, the management, and we put it on a very large piece of bright neon orange paper, and we hung it on the door, and I said, nobody's allowed to come into my room until they read that sign. That's awesome. uh, (laughs) Yeah, it was amazing. It it took on a life of its own. Somebody took a picture of it and it went viral. It went all over the internet. It uh, earned me an invitation to the White House to meet President Bush, who signed it. Uh, We we had we had it framed, and I donated it to the hospital to Walter Reed. So um, to this day, uh, it's, it hangs in the middle of the wounded ward at Walter Reed. And I, I get all kinds of stories. People tell me how much that sign motivates them. Um, a friend of mine was up there recently and told me that the wood at the bottom of the sign has been rubbed uh, bare because guys will go by it and touch it as they go to surgery. Uh, and I've had uh, cancer patients. I've had individuals that have suffered severe accidents take my sign and put it on their door uh, of the hospital to, to accept this, this I overcome, no excuses, no pity mindset that, uh, that basically that sign captured. So uh, it's been amazing, you know, for something that I never put that much thought into when it happened, uh, merely just a... a just a statement that said I wasn't going to feel sorry for myself and, and I, you know, I was going to lead myself to be positive and drive forward. Wow. <clears throat> That's incredible. Hey, Jay, hold on just a second. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Army veteran Bob Eulin knows the struggles veterans face in the transition process and has dedicated his post-retirement years to helping veterans successfully transition into the civilian sector. His new book, Transitions 2.0, is one of the best books for any veteran facing the transition process. You can find Transitions 2.0 at veteranonthemove.com, 
slash transitions. Also, Bob Yuen is the chairman and CEO of the Center for Transitional Leadership. CTL seeks to assist and empower Armed Forces personnel during their transition from military service to private sector employment, with particular focus on helping military men and women position themselves to be sought-after candidates in the civilian workforce. I have the pleasure of serving on the board of directors for CTL, and you can check out the CTL website by going to veteranonthemove.com slash CTL. All right, we're back talking with Navy SEAL Jason Redman. And Jason, before the break, you're telling us your compelling story in, in that poster you put up on on the wall of your of your door at uh, Walter Reed. And you really almost you know, became famous for that because I remember that like – uh, like about ten years ago, when that when that sign went up on your door, I saw that and heard about it, and people were talking about. It. I was still in the Marine Corps at the time, so um, you're, you're you're famous, but you know, every once in a while, people probably don't realize who wrote that sign. So it's great to hear the story from the guy who actually wrote it down. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. So obviously, you've in, you had some severe wounds, even. Even beyond your physical wounds, there's there's some mental and emotional stuff going on there. And, and you know, fortunately, the Navy allowed you to finish out your career and retire. But you still went through a horrendous transition yourself. And like a lot of the listeners on our show, you know, when they transition, they don't want they don't want to go get a job, or if they do, it's just to pay the bills. In your case, you went right after the entrepreneurship side of things. And had had a pretty tough go at it. So, what was your transition like when you finally did retire? Uh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, the transition was uh, an interesting one for me. For one thing, I had already launched the nonprofit while I was on active duty, so that that car was already driving down the road. So already, I had this one arm of the organization that or one arm of business that I was running that I needed to continue to run. Uh, but the nonprofit paid me a, 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 a not even close to poverty level. I mean, it was an incredible minimal salary. So it wasn't anything that I could support my family on once I got out. And I didn't want to defer dollars to a salary for me. I, I wanted dollars to go towards mission and to help grow the infrastructure of the organization. So I started looking at, okay, what else can I do? Um, I had been through the sign on the door. I had been speaking a lot uh, within the military and for military nonprofits. And I had been told, wow, you know, you're a great speaker. You've got a great story. And of course, uh, I got approval from the Navy and the SEAL teams to, to write a book about that journey. So between those two things, I said, well, you know what? I'll, I'll become a speaker. So I reached out to speaking companies and none of them were interested in signing me. <laughs> um, I, you know, most of the time I'd hear, oh, you know, we already represent this SEAL or we already represent these military members. We don't need more. Um, and so finally I said, OK, well, fine. If, if they're not going to represent me, then I am going to create my own company. And that led to the creation of soft spoken sof spoken as a speaking and consulting company and um i think many of us in the military uh those of us who have have served a career there there's i think there's a natural tendency that we're going to step out into the civilian world and that our leadership capabilities and our background and everything is going to lead to this instant success that we're just going to create these companies and, you know, we're going to be bringing in money. And unfortunately, 90% of the time, it doesn't work that way. And I know for me, with the speaking company, we, we launched it and I wasn't booking anything. Um, I mean, if it wasn't for my retirement pay, you know, we were, we were in danger of going broke. And, uh, I think I had been out for about six months and, I hadn't booked a single speaking engagement, um, even though I'd gotten good exposure with the book. I'd been on some national media. We had done a pretty good job with our social media and presence. And uh, and I, I was reaching a point where I told my wife, I said, I'm going to have to go find a real job because we've, we've got to pay the bills. And it was right about that time 
um, that uh, I had a company out of Chicago book me for a speaking engagement. And that speaking engagement was kind of the domino effect. And uh, after that, they just started to come. And, uh, and, you know, I started averaging at least one speaking engagement a month, if not multiple. And we started building the company around that. So I, I, my biggest advice for any veteran out there, if you're going to go down the entrepreneur path is one, it's going to be hard. I just want to let you know that right up front, but, uh, it is your tenacity, what I call the overcome mindset that's going to lead to success and, and success may not be in the timetable that you think it's going to be, but you've got to stay the course, you know, you've got to keep grinding away and pressing because eventually that domino will fall. Um, thankfully those of us that retire, we do have that retirement pay a little bit of that buffer. So, uh, for those out there, if you're contemplating getting out of the military before 20, I would say, Hey, you know, finish your career because that retirement pay is a godsend. Uh, it gives you a little bit of a buffer in order to be able to make those, um, you know, to go down that entrepreneurial road. Because I tell you what, now that I have worked as an entrepreneur, I've been out for four years. The biggest thing about being an entrepreneur is freedom. You have the freedom to make the choices on what you're going to do with your day and with your schedule and your future. So, um, you know, I don't miss many of my kids sporting events. If I'm in town, I'm there. And that's, that's a huge thing for me after spending so much time in the military being gone. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend it to anybody. I will say the other thing, um, the, the, the other thing that I struggled with was something a little more insidious that I didn't even notice was happening until about two years after I was out. And I think the average person who knew me would say, wow, you know, look at you, you're successful. You've got two companies, you know, you're, you've got a book, you're bringing in money. Um, but I was struggling mentally. Um, and I couldn't figure out why. I mean, obviously, some of it was scars from the wounds of war, mental scars. But others of it was something that I didn't realize was happening until about two years after I got out. I took back. I looked back and, and figured it out. And I'll tell you what the catalyst that caused it to happen is about two years after I got out. Uh, over that two year period, I had stopped working out. I was totally focused on growing the company. I didn't have a very good balance in other areas of my life. So not working out. I was, I was, I had a terrible diet. I was drinking, uh, an incredible amount, much more than I should have been drinking. And I went to the doctor about two years after I was out and the doctor looked at my blood work and, and he said to me, you know, he said, you're doing a lot of good things, but you're going to be that guy that's dead at 45 from a heart attack. And I have high cholesterol and, and my grandfather died of a heart attack. So all these things, you know, we have a family history of this. So it made me say, wow, I really got to make some changes. And, um, and as I started to make those changes in my life, it made me realize how much I needed it and how much the military creates that, that structure for a reason. It enables you to be more successful. It enables you to get that level of accomplishment. Um, I found that because I was running my own schedule, I didn't always have to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, so I found myself sleeping in later and later over those first couple of years until finally, suddenly, I, you know, I wasn't even getting the office till 10 o'clock. And, uh, and then I couldn't figure out why I wasn't able to get everything done that needed to be done. And then not working out, not eating, not building that structure. What I talk about, how you lead yourself. And that's the biggest thing in the civilian world. And it's the number one thing that I've talked to other veterans is figuring out how to build that structure and lead themselves in the civilian world. Um, today, fast forward four years later, um, I have, uh, I, I drink very little. I work out, uh, virtually every day. Um, and, and that's an integral part of my day. You know, I start the day with a workout and then, you know, I get into my day of business and I lay out that schedule. I lay out those goals of what I want to accomplish for the day within, you know, what I want to accomplish for the next three months. 
And, uh, and that's how I go after it. So that, that's probably my biggest advice to those that are out there. Uh, there's a natural tendency for veterans after we've been in the military to say, gosh, for X amount of years, 20 years or plus for those of us that did a career to say, um, man, I just want a little freedom. So I'm going to let my hair grow out. I'm, you know, I don't want to worry about wearing a uniform, you know, t-shirt and shorts are the uniform of the day. And, you know, I don't want to get up early, so I'm going to sleep in a little bit. And I've talked to so many individuals who slide down that slippery slope. So my advice is build that structure back into your life. Get on a schedule, start working out, take care of yourself, identify the goals and how you're going to go down that path to find your success. Because in the civilian world, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to jerk a knot in you like they would in the military and say, hey, you know, private so-and-so or sergeant so-and-so or, hey, young lieutenant, you're being a moron. Get your act together. In the civilian world, especially if you're an entrepreneur, nobody's going to say anything to you. And you'll just slide your way right into right into oblivion and right into failure. So you have to lead yourself. You have to set your own structure. You have to lead yourself to success in the civilian world. Absolutely. And I, I've ex- I experienced like all, all of the same exact things in the last four years since I've been retired. And in many cases, if you come to the realization of, okay, I, I, I've tried to do this myself and I can't, that doesn't mean you failed as an entrepreneur. It just means you need to bring somebody in that can hold you accountable. And that can be another veteran friend, family member. You can even hire, hire a coach. You can, you can hire you can hire a workout coach, you can hire a business coach, you can hire a how to run your personal life coach. I mean, there's all sorts of coaches out there and they do a lot of good. It's nothing other than pulling accountability into your life, bringing it in and even even paying for it. You're paying somebody to make you get out of bed on time in the morning and be accountable to getting things done. There's, I know a lot of successful entrepreneurs, they would never go without their their coaches or their coaching programs or their accountability partners. You know, obviously, you know, if, if money's tight, obviously you don't have to pay for some of these folks, but you can do it through through a workout partner. You know, your buddy's at the gym calling you saying, hey, man, why aren't you here? Uh, well, you better get down here right now. You know, it, it's as simple as that. And many of us in the, that were spent years in the military, we we looked so forward to getting away from that structure and that accountability, and we would get away from it we don't realize how much we actually needed it. And so you've, you've got to plug those things back in your life. So yeah, very, very well said. Um, Jason. So you initially started with your apparel company, wounded wear, and then walk us through the sequence of events with wounded wear, combat wounded coalition, the soft spoken speakers bureau, and Overcome Academy and how all those have come about and interrelate. Yeah, I mean, Wounded Wear was the original company and it was the clothing and clothing modifications for the Wounded Warriors. And we had a lot of success with that. Um, you know, to date, we've distributed, uh, I think we're at about 1.6 million in clothing for Wounded Warriors. Um, but we, we, you know, I think with any company, it is critical that you're constantly evaluating. I think you should be doing it as a person. You know, where am I at currently? Am I, am I, am I at my new hundred percent? And if I'm not, then how do I get to that new hundred percent? And what tweaks do I need to make? You know, what, what areas, um, of my strengths can I, can I strengthen? And obviously, what areas of weakness, weaknesses can I minimize? And it's the same with any business. So Wounded Wear, we started to recognize a trend um, that happened in uh, 2012-13 timeframe. And it was directly related to, in 2010, we stopped combat operations in Iraq. And in 2012, we scaled back combat operations in Afghanistan. So the number of wounded warriors that were going through the hospital greatly declined, which was awesome. But for us as an organization, our direct interface with the individuals that we were trying to provide service to it declined. The other thing that happened is there was starting to be a mass exodus of individuals getting out of the military. And businesses who were supporting us uh, were no longer interested in providing funding for clothing. 
Uh, they basically said, hey, how does this help someone get a job? How does this help someone get better educated to, to be successful? Um, you know, and then of course, uh, focus on the, uh, the invisible wounds of war, post traumatic stress and traumatic brain injuries. So we as a company took a step back, myself and the board, and we said, you know, we really probably need to grow. Uh, we need to look at how we can make an impact. We, we talked to other wounded warriors that were out there and other organizations and we didn't want to reinvent. We didn't want to create, uh, an identical mission that somebody else was doing, but instead we said, how do we leverage what other people already are doing? And that led to the idea of the creation of the combat wounded coalition, where we would identify key organizations that were doing good things, vet them, because a lot of people want to know, uh, that their money is going to an organization where the, the money goes to the mission. And, uh, we, wanted to be a part of that process. Uh, we also saw a lot of wounded warriors who were struggling uh, because they would have a need and they would hear of an organization that could help fulfill that need and they would reach out to that organization. And then unfortunately, that organization would say, hey, sorry, you don't really meet our criteria. You know, these are the demographics we serve and you're outside of those demographics. And, you know, everybody out there that's a veteran knows we're a proud bunch and it's really hard to swallow your pride and ask for help. So it only takes a few times of being turned down after you've reached out for help that you stop reaching out for help. So we wanted to mitigate that. We wanted to vet these organizations, understand exactly what the right and left limits were. And then if we had a wounded warrior come to us and say, I'm looking for X, Y and Z, we knew unequivocally the organization that was partners with us could fulfill that need. So that that's what the Combat Wounded Coalition became. And then uh, the Overcome Academy is the future. The Overcome Academy was actually a for-profit idea I had for my speaking company to and it goes back to a lot of what I was talking about earlier, how you lead yourself and build structure into your own life and, and make sure you are maintaining a good balance. If you want to be a leader in the world, it is absolutely critical that you have a balance in all aspects of your life, uh, that, you know, your physical health is good, your emotional health, uh, your, your, your social health, your, uh, mental health and your spiritual health. Those five areas, I call it the Pentagon of performance. You need to have a balance in all those areas because as a leader, you have to maintain high levels of energy and motivation. And those are all the areas of, of life that are critical for us to drive forward and be successful. And, um, and the Overcome Academy was all about that idea of how to teach people how to lead themselves. Um, but <laughs> I was already doing so many different things. I didn't know how I could create this additional arm for my for-profit company. And I had two things happen that led me to decide to, to do this on the nonprofit side initially for wounded warriors. One, uh, I was asked to speak multiple times for schools and I really enjoyed getting in front of kids and sharing my message of uh, leadership, overcoming adversity. Life is not fair, but you still have to drive forward and find success and, and collaborate and work with others. I mean, that's how the real world works. And, and kids that I spoke to really ate that up. And it led to many schools asking me to come in and speak. But of course, schools have no funding. You know, all these schools wanted me to come in and speak for free. Right. And I rely on speaking income to pay my bills. So I said, God, and I already do, uh, you know, half the speaking engagements I do, I do for free or greatly reduced already. So I said, man, how do I, how do we do this? I personally feel we're at a time in our nation where America's children need a, renew, a renewed look at grit and resiliency and the ability to adapt to the unexpected. Um, I, I think that there's a little bit of a current mindset where quitting is perceived as okay. You know, it's like, hey, if that right. makes you uncomfortable, you should just quit. If somebody says something to you that makes you uncomfortable, well, you know, you should be offended and, you know, we should take you out of this situation. 
And the real world doesn't work like that, you know? So I think we need to get in front of the youth of America today and talk to them about how the real world works from people who have actually been there and experienced it. That led me to the idea. I've had a lot of wounded warriors who have asked me how they could get into speaking. And I said, you know, what a great idea. The Overcome Academy could be specifically for wounded warriors, where we teach them how to lead themselves, how to build structure, how to build the overcome mindset. And we teach them how to speak and tell their story with a purpose uh, so that their story is about leadership and it's about overcoming adversity and it's about adapting to the unexpected because, you know, these guys and gals have physical or invisible wounds of war that the average person might have said, well, I want nothing to do with the rest of the world. And we want to flip that coin. We need them to be out there and setting the example and motivating and inspiring people. We need them to be the next greatest generation. And that is what the Overcome Academy is about. Yeah, that's motivating. Hey, Jason, uh, we're, unfortunately, we're about out of time. What's the best way for somebody listening to get a hold of you, whether it's somebody that might want to get involved in in the Overcome Academy and, and become a soft, uh, soft-spoken soft speaker or some other type of uh, business information, general veteran contact? What's the best way? Yeah, Joe, absolutely, man. Thank you. Uh, so if you are interested in Combat Wounded Coalition or the Overcome Academy, go to combatwoundedcoalition.org. Every warrior is sponsored by a company, so we are looking for companies who want to sponsor these warriors, and there is a mentorship program we have built into this where your company, a group of selected individuals within your company will work directly with this wounded warrior as they move down this path of leadership, uh, and they also will come back and speak for your company. So combatwoundedcoalition.org, you can find out more information about us and contact us. If you are interested in having me come out as a speaker or consultant, uh, go to softspoken.com, softspoken.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Jason Redmond WW. Uh, you can find me on Facebook at Jason Redmond WW. And if you subscribe to my YouTube channel under Jason Redmond, uh, every other week I have an online show called the JR Overcome Show talking about many of the things we've talked about today. That's awesome, Jason. Well, thanks for sharing your uh, phenomenally deep and inspirational story. And uh, thanks for sharing your your transition struggles and, and entrepreneurial journey w- with the rest of us. Uh, it's been it's been very inspirational. Awesome. Well, Joe, thanks so much for having me on. And to to everybody out there that's listening, my motto to you guys, there is only one path forward. There is only one motto. I overcome. Lead yourself to success. Outstanding. Well said, Jason. All right. Well, these two veterans are Oscar Mike. As you can tell from listening to the Veteran on the Move podcast, interviews are a great way to tell your story and spread the word about your business. If you would like to get booked as a podcast guest, I recommend Interview Valet. You can check out Interview Valet at veteranonthemove.com slash valet. Be sure to check out Thrive15.com, the world's premier online education platform that helps entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs learn how to start or grow a successful business. Start your free 30-day membership by going to Thrive15.com and use the promo code VETERAN. Thank you for listening to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. So until next time... This veteran is Oscar Mike.